Good morning. The Milton Dance Head and Neck Center at the Greater Baltimore Medi Medical Center was established to honor Milton Laddie Dance, a 25-year head and neck cancer survivor. Today, the Dance Center is comprised of its rehabilitation staff as well as the Johns Hopkins Head and Neck Surgery at GBMC and the Johns Hopkins Voice Center at GBMC. The center includes 40 individuals who provide care, including head and neck surgeons, laryngologists, oral medicine, oral pathology, speech language pathology, oncology, social work, nursing, and dietary, as well as research and support staff. The center's aim is to provide the coordinated care that we, we would all want for our loved ones. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Joseph Califano, our incoming director, to introduce the 2012 Milton Dance Lecture. Thank you, John. Uh, you know, as the uh, Dr. Mock pointed out, our job is to stop this uh, uh, chariot driven by horses and his surgeons. Sometimes we take a little bit more of a crude approach. We remove the chariot, the horses, and even a large section of the road uh, in front of and behind this. And uh, our next uh, lecturer uh, helps us with that because as surgeons, when we uh, make the uh, road impassable for any type of vehicle, uh, he fixes that problem, repairs the road, and sometimes makes it even better than it was. So our Dr. Fuchan Wei is truly a giant in his field. Uh, he uh, became chairman of the Department of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery at Changgung Memorial Hospital in Taiwan. He made very seminal contributions to the development of free tissue transfer and reconstruction, including the fibula free flap. Uh, but as a uh, true virtuoso, he also applied his talents to larger programmatic development. In fact, now serves as chancellor uh, of the uh, medical uh, university there. Uh, he is uh, an extraordinary contributor to the field and to uh, the reconstructive field in general. He has too numerous to count articles, keynote lectures, and a variety of uh, uh, fellows that have populated the world in various departments as leaders. And uh, the reason uh, I suspect why he maybe wanted to come back to Toronto is way back when he actually completed a fellowship here. So I don't want to take any more time away from his lecture to truly talk about all his accomplishments. It would take a lot longer. I'd just like to welcome him and uh, look forward to his talk. Thank you very much for your introduction, John and Joe. Good morning, my friends and ladies and gentlemen. It's indeed a great pleasure and honor for me to speak to you in this very important occasion. And I'm going to share with you my thought and my approach of segmental mandibular defect reconstruction. I intentionally entitled my talk to optimize the functional aesthetic result in order to respond to the spirit of uh, Dance, Mr. Dance, and also uh, his wife, uh, Mrs. Vance, and as well as the spirit of the Great Baltimore Medical Center, Milton Dance Head and Neck Cancer Center. As we know that segmental mandibular defect reconstruction is challenge. Although there are some non-microsurgical techniques, but most of them may not be useful, especially when they are massive bone, uh, bone defect, or the defect is associated with soft tissue, either inside the oral cavity or in the external face. And in the cases that has been irradiated, the non-vascular bone graft may not work. And osteoarthritis, of course, the uh, non-vascular bone graft cannot help at all. And sometimes there are multiple attempts for reconstruction of this segmented defect that end up fair. In those cases, usually we need to use the vascular bone graft for reconstructions. There are many reconstructive options of donor site. However, ideally that all those defects either segmented mandibular defect alone or associated with soft tissue defect 
ideally can be achieved in one stage with good function and appearance. In the earlier days, I have tried many options of bone graft donor site. However, later on, I settled down on the vascular fibula bone. The anatomy study was uh, performed by Ian Teller in Australia, by Chen Zhongwei in China, Matamai in Japan, and it's well studied. We all know that Vantage, including this good bone lens, 20 to 26 bone can be harvested for reconstruction and the good vascularity. The fibula carried endosteal blood supply and the periosteal supply, basically from peroneal artery. And the book, the good uh, bone quality allow for uh, osteotomy. And uh, also that the straight bone allow for contouring. However, the skin pedal that can be harvested together with the fibula from the lateral aspect of the leg still remain unknown until early 80s. At that time, we happened to perform a cadaver dissection study. And here you see they are skin, the, se the septocutaneous vessels and the myocutaneous uh, perforators, both of them are rising from the peroneal artery and they go either traverse only in the posterior cruda septum that's located uh, between the peroneus muscle and the thesaurus muscle, or it goes through some of the uh, intramuscular course before it reaches the skin. In my earlier days, in order to reduce the donor side mobility, I try not to include those that have intramuscular course. Therefore, I ligate all those myocutans uh, perforators and then I inject the thigh through the peroneal artery and get the standing, as you can see here, centered along the posterior margin of the fibula and at the junction of the mid and low third of the fibula. And this means if you are able to identify septocutaneous vessels between those two muscles, and then you are able to design a skin flap based on its distribution here. So the skin item become very reliable, and in this uh, manner, we are able to harvest the fibula together with skin without inclusion of any muscle between them. If you are interested in using the skin pedal as an innovative flap, you can also include the lateral sura nerve. However, the lateral sura nerve anatomy is quite uh, variable, and it's also located in the higher part of the lower extremity, but the more reliable vascularity of the skin pedal is on the lower part, so you have to make a balance. And at this time, because I am not uh, enthusiastic about the innovation of the skin pedal anymore, so at this time, I don't include the lateral sunar nerve. Because of the way of harvesting the fibula as a fibula osteoseptocutaneous blood without including any muscle in between them, we are able to have a flexible relationship between the fibula and the skin pedal. Here, as you can see, the fibula can be parallel with the skin pedal, and it can be perpendicular to the skin pedal. This is because of lack of tethering effect by the muscle. And even you want to have a double barrel fibula for reconstruction, and you include the skin, you are able to align the bone and the skin in this manner. And in 1989, uh, David Hidalgo of uh, New York, the first time he uh, utilized the fibula for mandibular reconstruction. Earlier on, uh, where uh, Bill Schwartz uh, in Pittsburgh also had the same idea, he double bellow the fibula, but it used for long bone reconstruction. And since then, we uh, become interested in this flap, and then we are able to do multiple osteotomy uh, depending on the, donor, on the recipient side requirement. As you can see here, uh, this osteotomy uh, leave the periosteum intact so that the periosteal, periosteal blood supply won't be disrupted. So this is my uh, uh, personal uh, observation 
that when we compare various donor sites for composite mandibular defect reconstruction, we look at the bone component and as well as the soft tissue component, it's my personal uh, opinion that fibula is uh, better in general than the other donors on the donor side, including ileum, scapula, and the radius. Of course, sometimes when the fibula is not available, then you have to also choose to use the other donor side. And here is the clinic uh, cases that we have uh, performed, the mandibular reconstruction and the maxillary reconstruction uh, is about 80% of all the vascular uh, fibula that we have been using for reconstruction for various uh, purposes. And here is a patient, present, a young boy present with amenoblastoma. And this segmented defect of the mandible then was reconstructed with a double valved fibula. As you can see the design here. We remove a segment between those two uh, segments to avoid pinch on the periosteal blood circulation. And we are able to get this kind of result. And this is an old gentleman who had the squamous cell carcinoma involved uh, gingiva. So the resection end up a segmented mandibular defect and associated with flow, a uh, mouse flow lining defect. So we use the same approach, a fibular osteoseptocutane flap for reconstruction of the bone and also flow of the mouse. And the rest, remaining uh, excess part of the skin pedal then was the epicellus and used to cover the reconstruction plate. By doing this, we are able to prevent uh, from uh, too much uh, pressure and then exposure of the plate and also we are able to provide you know, certain uh, augmentation of the defect and here you can see the patient. And here is another patient present to, to me with a very giant amenoblastoma in a young lady and uh, we did a complete resection segmented defect. You can see the defect is from subconda to subconda. And here also showing that we preserve the inferior alveolar nerve. And then we use this same kind of technique and provide her the reconstruction. And this is the appearance. It's about four months after surgery. And immediate after surgery, in every follow-up, the patient always show her appreciation to me. But about three to four months later, I found that patient become depressed. And when he came to my clinic, he, she never liked to talk. So I got a chance to chat with her, and then she said to me, I appreciate your surgery, and however, can you imagine that a, that a, a normal mandible without teeth, can I be happy? And because of that kind of stimulation, I start to think if I'm able to do osteointegration teeth on her. That was in the early 90s. So this is the result of our trial. And as you can see, we then proceed to do osteointegration teeth with our uh, dentist colleague, and then we finally get this kind of result. And recently, I followed her after 20 years, and the teeth still remain useful. After we have uh, performed many cases of uh, secondary osteointegration teeth to the nail mandible, which was reconstructed with vascular bone, then we start to ask, are we able to do osteointegration teeth at the time of mandibular reconstruction with vascular bone graft? And the justification of that are better assessed to the bone for insertion of the osteointegration teeth. And it's also easier for us to assess the alveolar reach relationship. Of course, it helps us to uh, fasten our dental rehabilitation and reduce one or two surgical procedures. And however, because uh, osteointegration teeth is expensive in Taiwan and is not covered by the insurance, so therefore we have to be very careful in selecting the patient. At this time, we still select the patient that they have uh, non, they have the so-called non-tumoral origin, that kind of defect, uh, or sometimes uh, benign lesion. Of course, in some selected early uh, cancer case, 
we also uh, use the same technique for uh, one-stage reconstructions. And here, showing how we do that, we like to do osteotomy on a back table. And then here showing that we place the reconstruction plate first, and then we then have the bone uh, there, and then we decide where we want to have the osteointegration teeth. And after that, then we take the contract down to the back uh, table, and we perform the osteointegration teeth, and after that, we reinsert the contract, and then to check the alignment with the upper jaw. Here, as you can see, the waxy screw is here to check its alignment with the upper jaw, and once the alignment uh, is uh, confirmed, and then we replace this uh, waxy screw with cover screw, and then we complete our uh, uh, reconstruction. So with this kind of approach, here is the appearance of the, the first stage, mandibular reconstruction with fibula and osteointegration teeth inside, and then after re uh, radiologic evidence of bone healing between the osteotomy segment of the fibula and between the, uh, the fibula and the native mandible is evident in the uh, image. Then we proceed to do the second stage. At that time, we installed uh, the abutment, and then we also replaced the skin just around the abutment with a keratinized mucosa from the uh, palate. And then we provide a stain and protect that and this is the usual appearance, about 10 to 10 days, two weeks. So with this kind of approach, the young man present to us with amenoblastoma, very deformed, low chin, and the cross up here, and we're able to use this kind of approach and get the good result like this in a much faster time. And however, in this patient, we also use the same kind of approach but the um, segment involved the anterior. So although we solved the problem, but we end up a short face appearance, which the patient is not completely happy. So this is simply because of the inherent discrepancy between the native mandible and, and uh, the uh, uh, fibula. Therefore, we, uh, in the recent 10 years, we have done some technical refinement to improve the mandibular contour and height. The first method is that in the uh, ideal case, without any soft tissue coverage problem, we like to add one additional, additional reconstruction plate along the lower border of the native mandible. By doing that, we are able to restore the contour, and then we insert our vibular bone, and then sometimes we may need to use mini plate for fixation. And in this case, we also do one stage osteointegration teeth, and this is the result of such kind of approach. So we're not only able to reconstruct the function, but we also restore the appearance to a very symmetric and acceptable manner. The second method is the so-called double bellow fibula. And uh, the the uh, height of the fibula is only about half of that of the native mandible. So in this case, the defect, the defect is here, and then we design, because we need to reconstruct not only uh, this segment, but also the ascending normus. And then here, you see, we make a three osteotomy, and we remove this C segment. C second should be ideally should be two to three centimeter. If you don't remove that, the periosteum may be impinged, and then that com may compromise the circulation. So here you can see that we uh, install the osteointegration teeth in the upper bellow, and then this is the appearance of such kind of inset. And in this case, actually in most of cases, if we are able to identify the proximal and distal end of the uh, nerve, the inferior alveolar nerve, we always try to uh, restore the sensation with uh, the uh, sura nerve rod harvest from the same donor site. And after this kind of procedure, the patient is able 
to get quite reasonable result, not functionally sound, but also appearance is very acceptable. In case we proceed to do one strut reconstruction, and later on we find that height is not enough, either for osteointegration teeth implantation or for a restoration of the normal height, then you can perform a transverse osteotomy. Of course, you have to leave the periosteum intact, and then after that, you apply the destruction osteogenesis apparatus, and then with this apparatus, you're able to gain some of the bone, and after consolidation of this new bone formation, then we can proceed to the osteointegration teeth. And this is the case that we have performed in this manner. So with those three uh, modifications, now we are able to improve the appearance of the reconstructed mandible quite well. So I'd like to make my uh, conclusion that total rehabilitation of the segmental resection of the mandible is possible. The functional and aesthetic results it can be quite uh, acceptable. And also, the fibular osteoceptor cutaneous strap in my hand is ideal for segmental mandibular defect reconstruction. Of course, I don't deny that the other flap may also have the same advantages. Second, the fibula osteoceptor cutaneous flap is suitable for osteointegration teeth implantation. Third, there's no additional risk exist when we perform primary osteointegration teeth in the properly selected patient. And fourth, the technical refinement allow us to improve the contour and height of the nail mandible. And complete oral rehabilitation can therefore be achieved in a much short period of time. With this, I'd like to conclude my presentation. And once again, I'd like to thank the American Head and Neck Society for inviting me. And also, I'd like to thank our great Baltimore Medical Center, the Milton Dance uh, Center, for sponsor this lectureship. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wei. And in recognition of a superb talk and an elegant presentation, we'd like to present you with this uh, plaque from the American Head and Neck Society. Thank you.